Good evening. I don't know quite what it says about me that I'm beginning to get comfortable up here. Um, been up here enough at this point. Um, I want to start off by saying thank you to um, especially Robert for um, setting up these opportunities for the men to be able to preach, for Jason, not that you need a reason to want to not have to give a sermon tonight, um, but giving us these opportunities and letting us to have, have the chance to be able to get here because as the men of the congregation, this is a great opportunity for us to grow. So thank you for that and, um, you know, enjoy putting up with me for the next however long. Um, I, will, I will give some hope to you guys. I've been timing myself as I've gone through this several times and I've been averaging about 25 minutes, so five minutes will go by and we'll be done, more than likely is what ends up happening. I'm a teacher. That's my job. Not just a teacher, but I'm a middle school teacher. And usually the question that I get asked of that is, did you intend to be? And the answer is yes, I intended to be. Then they ask what I do, and I tell them, well, I teach theater. And I get the, oh, did you intend to do that? Yes, I did intend to do that. But in my time being an educator, in my time teaching, I have recognized that there are some, some fascinating things being able to see about the age group that I teach, specifically middle school. Now, everybody wants to talk about elementary. Everybody wants to talk about high school. Elementary specifically because it's that foundational stuff. Everyone's fascinated. They want to learn. They want to grow. All of the kids are curious about what's getting to go on. You get to fascinate them with stuff like baking soda volcanoes, right? Everyone also wants to talk about high school because that's the point at which you get to see go out people go out into the world. Students come into their own and grow into their own and become leaders in their own right. But nobody ever talks about what happens at the middle school level. Usually what ends up happening is when that gets brought up, you have people that look at you and go, oh, bless you. You chose to deal with that. But in my time there, again, I'm fascinated by the things that I get to see my kids experience. Middle school is hard, y'all. That is the first time in a person's life where they begin to realize, as one of my friends put it, that other people are people too. And it sounds silly, but it's true. That's the first time where we really move beyond the fundamentals of life and move into expanding our understanding, helping us to deal with other people and putting the burden on our own shoulders to begin to grow because no one else can force us that way. So if you're one of those that paid attention to the bulletin or, or read into uh, what was down there, you probably noticed the title of tonight's sermon was Stuck in Middle School. Some of you might have expected a very pessimistic lesson from me, but what I will tell you is, looking around at the church, I honestly would say there's a lot of similarities between middle school and a lot of congregations. You know, people find the truth, they find the church, and just like those elementary kids, they become fascinated. They absorb what's information that is given to them. They want to know more, they want to learn more, they want to grow. Once they hit that middle section, we're supposed to move beyond that growth and begin to expand out to other people, helping other people, finding other people that can help us to grow, because we're now responsible for our own growth. And then at that master's level, where I think Jason has been trying to get us, which is now that you've grown, you've got to take on that leadership position. You've got to start finding ways to reach out beyond yourself, well beyond yourself, and grow into it. So digging in tonight, I, I want to approach this from that perspective, because I think whenever it comes to the church, all too often we look around and we see people who are, spiritually speaking, stuck in middle school, stuck in a perspective of wanting others to do for them instead of beginning to develop out into their own. I want to start us off looking at Proverbs 20, uh, chapter 20 and verse 4. And I probably should have written down specifically what the verse said, but you know what? We're going to go there together. It reads, The lazy man will not plow because of winter. He will beg during the harvest and have nothing. Some of you might be wondering what I mean by that or why I would go there. 
And for me, the biggest limitation that I see with the students that I come through, I, sh I should probably state, um, this is why I should have had a PowerPoint. Uh, the, the three points that I want to hit on tonight are, in order for us to grow faithfully, we need to start surrounding ourselves with good company. We need to start approaching people with empathy and with humility. And last but not least, we need to become self-aware and strive to learn. Those are the three big things that we need to move past if we want to grow into a leader that God expects us to be. Starting off with good company, again, it's kind of weird to pull out a laziness deal. But here's the question that I have for you. How many of you have had a Bible study with somebody? Or let's pull that back even farther. How many of you have made a solid friend with somebody who is not a member of the church? Now, more often than not, whenever we hear about surrounding ourselves with good company, we hear about it in that elementary foundational era, right? Be aware of who it is that you surround yourself with, because they can corrupt your morals. And that's true. That's fair. Lest we be confused by what I'm saying tonight, I do not want anyone to, file, to follow someone blindly. That's foolish. But at the same time, there is value in having those friends. Whenever I ask people why they don't have Bible studies with people, the first response that we usually always get is, we're afraid to. Well, why? We're afraid of the questions we might be asked. That's fair. That is fair. Those questions can be terrifying, right? But here's, here's my point. If we're going to grow spiritually, we're going to have to test ourselves. We're going to have to stretch ourselves. Again, I'm not talking about following blindly, but we are going to have to test what ideas we think we understand about the Bible. Test those things with study. Test those things with prayer. And if we are not putting ourselves around some people that can force us to ask those questions, then those questions go unanswered, and we limit ourselves overall. On top of which, I would also point out, we hear more often than not from this very pulpit, that for other people, sometimes the only Bible that they are going to get is you. And whenever I hear that, I have to question for myself, why am I keeping that Bible from those people? Right? Granted, it's an analogy, but the analogy fits. We are choosing to prevent somebody else from having that opportunity to grow because we're afraid. And what does that ultimately say about us? Staying in Proverbs and jumping over to Proverbs 14, I think provides a, a solid response to this fear that we have on growing ourselves, on surrounding ourselves, maybe not completely, but surrounding ourselves with people that make us question. Chapter 14 and verse 23 he writes, in all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. What's the point there? If the work is worth it, if the hard work that we put in is worth it, there will be a reward on the back end. And that hard work, again, sometimes requires us to ask those questions of ourselves that we are terrified to ask. I know for a fact from having conversations with members here that there are some who have gone into those Bible studies terrified because of the questions that they have to ask and the approach that they have to take. But I could also tell you right now, not having directly talked with that person, if I asked them now if they grew from it, they'd say yes. We have to begin surrounding ourselves. If we want to grow beyond the elementary level, we have to begin putting people into our lives that are going to make us ask the important questions, questions that we wouldn't answer, be willing to answer ourselves. And sometimes that's going to be members of the church that are going to push us, and sometimes that's going to be people outside of the church. Because here's the thing. If it's an important question for them, maybe it should be an important question for us. Otherwise, they wouldn't ask it, right? If we are unwilling to move beyond the way that we've always done it, the way we are always going to do it is the way that we are going to do it. And while that doesn't seem like much, I want to give you guys an analogy. How many of you were of the belief, like I was, that it was illegal to have the lights on in the car at night? Because that's what we were told. 
you never question that, you never learn the truth. So maybe we need to surround ourselves with people that are going to give us those questions. Second of all, we need to be able to approach people with some level of empathy and humility. We need to begin to realize that we are not the be-all, end-all. That sometimes, intentionally or not, we can become. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, Paul is writing to the people at Galatia, telling them how to deal with the struggles of that world that's around him. The last chapter of Galatians says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. All too often, we tend to approach people who are dealing with problems, approaching this from a level of empathy. We tend to approach people who are dealing with problems in a very unempathetic way. We just do. We might be able to sympathize with them, we might be able to feel sorry for them, but we never are able to put ourselves in their positions. And unfortunately, in doing so, we create a situation just like what we read in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17 of the be warm and filled approach. We approach that person, we tell them, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll pray for you. Thoughts and prayers. I'll go change my Facebook profile over to some banner, right? And then we leave it at that. It is very easy to listen. It is not easy to hear. To truly sit in and hear what somebody is saying, hear what they are dealing with beyond the verbal, digging into that emotional side. Now, for, for the ladies who are here, that might be easier for you. For guys, this can be more difficult. I'll, I'll speak for myself, it's uncomfortable. If I see anybody crying, it's uncomfortable. But being willing to be there for that person, being willing to listen to that person, is one of the most valuable things that we can do for someone else. And again, if we're striving to move towards a more empathetic approach, it's going to require us to maybe be that little bit of uncomfortable. I think it's important to remember a uh, concept that's out there. Have any of y'all ever heard of the idea of the curse of knowledge? If you have, then you already know this. If you haven't, the curse of knowledge is a theory that states once we know something, once we have learned something, we completely forget and no longer are able to understand what it was like to not know it. Now, in, in my time teaching middle school, I can tell you I've dealt with that more than a time or two. The students that come across my way that I look at and I go, that's dumb what you did. Why'd you do that? But I also know for a fact that I'm not in the same boat that they were. I've gotten onto the other side of that. And so I have to listen to what it is that they have said and go, okay, so what can we learn from that? When it comes to helping other people, um, w we can talk about this in the nature of people within the world who are struggling with sin, who are in the worst possible positions that they could be in life. We can talk about it from that perspective, but let's approach it from somebody within the church because it's much easier to judge somebody within the church harshly. Somebody comes to you and tells you that they are in a horrible situation in their life due to some struggle that they have with addiction, with lust, with greed, with you name it. And we look at that person and we find it very easy to go, oh, that's where they went wrong. Is that what they need at that point? Is that what that person needs? Is that what you would need if you were in that position? Again, that curse of knowledge is a painful thing to deal with because we may have dealt with some of those things in our own life. We may have been in that position once before, but just with that curse of knowledge, we may have forgotten what it was like to feel that pain, to feel that shame sometimes. We need to be willing to humble ourselves 
to look at ourselves in the shoes of that other person and the struggle that they are dealing with because it is far too easy for us to get the fact that we were once in the same boat. If not literally, through the sin that, have, we, through the sin that we have dealt with in our lives, in the same boat. I'll give you one example from my own life. I have a, a friend who shall remain nameless, who is not a member of the church, but who is somebody that I work with. And he attends a denomination, and I came into his room one afternoon just to have a conversation with him, just to see how he was doing. Shoot the breeze. And he informed me, because I decided to sit there and listen, truly listen, informed me about all of the horrible things that were going on in his life. The fact that his house was basically condemned, that he was about to be removed from his household, that he and his wife and his children were about to be homeless, that he barely had money to be able to cover that, that he also was dealing with dental problems that was causing him all kinds of nightmares. All of these struggles that he had, and I listened to him. And the number one thing that I did not bring up was money. And at the end of that conversation, this is not to toot my own horn, at the end of that conversation, he thanked me. Because what he told me was, I never want to bring this up at church. I asked him why. He said, because the reverend that's at my church is going to tell me, well, how much are you tithing? How much money are you putting back? Because that's the solution, obviously. And that didn't help him. But to know that there was somebody who was there who was willing to sit with him in the middle of those problems that he was dealing with, to truly listen to him, is what helped him to grow. We have become solid friends. He is a person that I hope one day to be able to make a difference in his life because of conversations like that. We have to be willing to sit in those uncomfortable situations. And I will give you one more before, uh, before I belabor this point too far. We want to look in Job chapter 2. Some of you might be guessing where I'm going with this. The three friends that Job had, now we can argue all day long about the, the direction that they ended up taking after this situation. But I want to point out a very solid starter that these three men had. So we're going to start reading in chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 11. Now when Job's three friends heard all of this adversity that had come upon him, Job has lost everything at this point. Each one, that came, uh, each one came from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, for they had made an appointment to gather together and to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. Each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. And we're going to pause here for just a second. These are three guys, and again, we can approach this from the fact that they have already in their mind what it was that Job did wrong. They already think they know that Job has done something horrible, and this is why he's being punished. But instead of approaching Job, immediately walking up to him and going, buddy, hey, psh, this is what you did wrong. Obviously, you've angered God. Instead of that, they approach Job from the traditional Jewish tradition, tearing their clothes, wailing, putting dust on their head, mourning with him, being in that same empathetic circle that Job was in. And then they take it one step further. In verse 13, so they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. They sat in silence. Anyone who has spent time around me knows silence is hard for me. I talk way too much, way too often about way too many things. What can I say in most situations? Probably too much. But I have to commend these three men at their starter, at least. that They approach Job as a friend, sitting in silence with that man for seven days, seven long days, to connect with him before ever bringing up all of the nonsense they brought up, sat with him and empathized in that moment. I think it would be important for us to strive to look for what it is that other people need. That empathy is an important thing. Beyond just surrounding ourselves with that good company, if we're going to keep it, 
we've got to be willing to empathize with it. We've got to look beyond ourselves and understand that, again, we once were in those same or similar positions and needed help as well, whether or not we wanted to admit it. We needed that help. I think a lot of the problems that we have nowadays with people and how we treat each other is whatever we approach it as, I'm going to treat someone else how I want to be treated, we kind of are. There is an epidemic within this world that we have of people with self-hatred. Just as we have an epidemic of people that believe that they have done nothing wrong, it's not their fault. And so we treat each other how we treat ourselves. I think if we're going to be able to help other people, moving into my third point, we need to start being self-aware. You know, I have, I have known many Christians in my life, whenever it comes to being aware of themselves, are completely face blind. People that when asked why they have certain standpoints that they have, refuse to change their standpoint, refuse to consider that maybe they might be wrong. Because being wrong means I'm wrong and I have to change. Self-awareness, unfortunately, is a very bitter pill to swallow, a good pill, but a bitter pill to swallow. To realize and accept about ourselves that there are things that are not perfect, that we need to change, that we need to grow beyond, that we need to stretch ourselves beyond. And to be self-ignorant is so much easier than to be aware of those few things, or those many things, as the case may be. But you know, ignorance is always a choice. And a choice to be ignorant is not a choice that's going to get you to heaven. There's always going to be things that we are not going to know. There, there will always be. The Bible is full of mysteries that we are never fully going to understand. But again, going back to that first point of questioning, there comes a point where we have to be willing to ask those questions, not just of others, but of ourselves and what we need to be able to grow. I think we need to be willing to ask of ourselves if we can be like those people that we read of in Acts 17, verses 10 through 11, that search the scriptures daily. Do we search our scriptures daily? Do we look into our Bibles and study our Bible, not just reading, but looking into it for areas that we can apply to our own lives, areas we can apply to our work with other people, that good company that we're trying to surround ourselves with? Is that something that we do? Or are we closer to the lukewarm church that we read about in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 17? Or, yeah, 14 through 22, my apologies. That chose to be lukewarm, that chose to be so... Blech, that God vomited them out of his mouth. Spew forth. That's a great visual. What are we going to choose to be? Who are we going to choose to be? Because we can choose to be self-aware or we can choose to be ignorant. The worst infraction that can happen in my classroom whenever it comes to my students is a refusal to try. I present a student with something that, in my mind, is fun, or is something that they need to know. And that student looks back at me and you get one of two responses. You get the, when am I ever gonna use this? Or you get a flat out, no. You get one of those two. And at that point, that person and I get to have a conversation. Because that's not acceptable. If we don't try, we don't grow. If we don't try, we don't know what we're good at or what we're bad at. If you don't try, you don't know where your talent lies. And again, going back to that self-awareness, if you don't try, you don't know yourself. You don't know who you really are. You don't know what you can and can't achieve until you try. You know, this is slightly off the cuff, but I'll, I'll uh, bring up a story that I remember reading about whenever it was, I believe it was Bruce Lee's doctor and him. And uh, this may or may not be a true story, but it's a very good story either way, so bear with me. That these two gentlemen, this amazing martial arts actor that we look at as the peak physical strength, used to do marathons every morning. They would run for miles and miles and miles. 
And eventually, Bruce Lee decided to expand the amount that they ended up running. He was bored, and he wanted to do more. And his doctor friend who was with him tried to keep up with him. And eventually, after a good long while of it, he started to feel his heart pounding, started to feel it slightly in pain, and told Bruce, I don't think I can do it. I'm, I'm, I need to stop. And Bruce said, okay, and kept going. So the doctor tried to keep up with him, and eventually that pain got a little bit more. And Bruce looked back at him. The doctor said, I, I, I think I need to stop. I feel like I'm going to die. And Bruce said, okay, and kept going. Eventually, Bruce pulled away. The doctor stopped. Bruce pulled away. When the doctor finally caught back up to him, this friend of his was furious with him. Didn't you understand? I was about to die. I was in pain back there. And his response to him was, you know, you stopped the moment you decided to give up. You decided that you didn't want to do it. Because you don't know how far you can go until you try. He had chosen to give up. Self-awareness, I go back to that statement. It is a bitter pill for us to swallow, but sometimes we need to be willing to look at ourselves honestly and ask ourselves, are we well below our limit? Or are there a few more plates that we can get spinning before something falls? And we're just afraid to try. Now, there may be some of you here tonight who may be frustrated with some of the things I said. I hope not. But I will tell you right now, if you have any questions about what I have said, if you want to talk with me, I am more than willing to have that conversation with you. My life is an open book. But all, what I will tell you is, if there are any of you here that are frustrated that, that I may have said something that offended you or may have bothered you, made you feel uncomfortable, I want you to know in putting together this lesson, I felt uncomfortable in how much I saw myself in the examples as well. Growth is a choice. God did not bring us into his fold to have us live on the fundamentals. We are not supposed to survive and thrive on milk. We need to be willing to look into ourselves and see whether we are at that high school level, able able and capable of helping another person, able and capable of being the leader that God asks us to be. Maybe we're still at that foundational level. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's where we need to be. Or maybe you're stuck in middle school and you just don't realize it yet. I forgot to mention this at the very beginning of the lesson, but I'll mention it now. In my personal experience and my perspective, the preacher's job is twofold, to inspire and to motivate, similar to a teacher. Hopefully tonight, in something that I have said, I have inspired you to consider where you are in your life and your walk with God. Just consider it. And if you feel that you are not where you need to be, number two, I hope that I have motivated you. Or that you choose to motivate yourself to move beyond middle school understanding and into what God expects out of each and every one of us. If you have any questions, if you need any help, any prayers from the church, you may come forward and do that at this time as together we stand and sing.